If you have a Bible with you this morning, turn with me there to Exodus 15. Exodus 15. Today we begin a new series that will take us through Christmas and even a few weeks into the new year. We're calling the series Songs of Salvation. The Bible records songs for us. You might immediately think of the book of Psalms, a whole collection, 150 various songs. But that's actually not the place in the Bible that I have in mind for, these, for this series. There are other songs, occasional songs, placed within various narratives in our Bible. And they come at key moments in God's redemptive plan. Thus, they're a big deal. And they relate to one another. They often build upon one another. Uh, Some lead to others. Some lean on ones that came before. And as they do, they grow and swell with significance. And Exodus 15 is one such song. In fact, it's the first song in the Bible. It's been called the Song of Moses or the Song of the Sea because it celebrates what we just read from Exodus 14, where God parted the Red Sea. What we'll see in weeks ahead is that Moses' song in Exodus 15 is leaned upon by other later biblical songwriters. It inspires other songs at key moments, like Hannah's prayer song, in 1 Samuel 2. We'll look at that next week. Likewise, King David's song in 2 Samuel 22, which leans upon Moses' song and Hannah's song. And when the young virgin Mary in Luke 1 was informed by the angel that she was miraculously carrying the Messiah in her womb, remember, She prays, she sings, and what she sings leans on those words of old, which Moses and Hannah and David and others used. Of course, this feeds into Christmas then. So here we are on December 2nd, the month of Advent, and we very much will spend time thinking about how God's people Respond to him in song as he saves in various ways at key times in his plan. That will take us right through the Christmas moment and on into eternity. I say eternity because the Apostle John, in one of his glimpses of heaven that he got as he recorded for us in the book of Revelation, in Revelation 15, He saw a great multitude of overcomers. And they were singing, he says, the song of Moses and the Lamb. The song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. These are songs of salvation. And today we start at the beginning of such songs with Exodus 15. We've already read the historical event in Exodus 15. 14. Now let's read the lyrical and musical response of God's people in chapter 15, verses 1 to 21. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea, and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. 
The floods stood up in a heap. The deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue. I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its full of them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind. The sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you've redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. The peoples have heard. They tremble. Pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Now are the chiefs of Edom dismayed. Trembling seizes the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them. Because of the greatness of your arm, they are still as a stone. Till your people, O Lord, pass by. Till the people pass by whom you have purchased. You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain. The place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode. The sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. For when the horses of Pharaoh and his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea. Then Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing. And Miriam, said, and Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord. For he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. Well, let's begin by noticing for ourselves, looking down in our own Bibles if you have one, noticing the beginning and end of our passage, that there is a, a twofold call to sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord. That's the first of four points I want to make from this passage. Sing to the Lord. In verse 1, Moses called on the people to sing and led them in singing. He said, I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider he's thrown into the sea. And then his big sister Miriam. In verse 20 and 21, she calls on the Israelite women to join her. Why? Why? Well, we should sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. So you don't have to wonder what this portion of Scripture is about. They've made it very clear. It's about singing. It's about singing to God and singing about his glorious triumph over the mighty Egyptian army. God saved his people that day. He saved them when the situation could not have been any more bleak. He, he saved them when there was no other hope for them other than for God to do the, the unthinkable, the unimaginable, the seemingly impossible. Now, we'll give some careful attention to what God did in this story and what its significance is in just a bit. But for now, we're simply noting that in response to what God did, they sang. They sang. This was a song that was led. Surely someone had to write the song. Surely it was Moses. The rest of the people had to, at some point, somehow learn this song, and it's possible that this was intended to be sung and learned in a sort of antiphonal back and forth fashion, that might be. But logistics aside, they sang. When God's people are saved, they sing. Yes, it's good for God's people to plan to sing. Yes, God's people should purpose to sing. They should even resolve to sing, even when they don't feel like singing. But here, 
God's people sing because they can't help but sing. It's compulsive. Moses wants to lead the people in this thought. I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. It is responsive. God acts and we respond accordingly. Two R words help us think about this. Revelation and response. And by revelation, I don't mean the last book of our Bibles. I mean God reveals and we respond. That's always the way it works. That's always the biblical order of worship. Whether we're talking about the routine of weekly corporate worship like this, or in those immediate, compulsive, knee-jerk reactions to something big God has just done. God reveals, his people respond. He speaks, and we sing. Which leads to the question then, if your praise to God is these days light, if it's distracted, bored, or non-existent, have you not seen what he's done? Are you not getting what he's revealed? Have you been asleep on the safe side of the Red Sea and missed what he's done? Do we think that those stories aren't for us? Is our first reaction to wonder whether this really could have happened? By the way, I I won't engage that simply because I believe in a God who can do anything he wants. I'm not too concerned about how the Red Sea got parted like this when God spoke worlds into existence. But we should ask, have we tasted and seen that the Lord is good? And if so, do we sing? That's the proper response to who God is to what he has done, and to what he will do. That's the rest of our outline. That's the remaining three points. In fact, it's the outline for the Song of Moses. If Moses' and Miriam's call at the beginning and end is something like the chorus, well, then the verses of the song seem to follow this pattern. Who God is... Verses 2 to 3. What he had just done. Verses 4 to 14. And what he will do. Verse 15 and following. And by the way, it's not just the verbal tenses of present, past, and future which show us the structure of this song. I think there are some other literary clues as well. Notice the use of, O Lord. In verse 6, in verse 11, in verse 16. These fall right in the middle of each of these musical verses, if we can call these sections as such. Notice that there's a refrain that takes place in each of those same spots. So verse 6, your right hand, O Lord, your right hand. Verse 11, who is like you, O Lord, who is like you? And verse 16, till your people pass by, till your people pass by. I think we have three verses, musical verses that is, with a lyrical high point right in the middle. We don't normally write songs that way, but the Hebrews apparently did. So on to those verses then. Number one, sing to the Lord. Number two, sing about who he is. That's what Moses does in verse two and three. He leads out. He gets personal. He says, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God and I will praise him. My father's God and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Oh, each one of those Short sentences and phrases really could deserve a a whole sermon. Each phrase is rich with theology and history. You think of just that one word, Lord. 
with small caps. You might know that that represents God's personal name. In Exodus 3, God said, if I'm going to go to Pharaoh and say, let the people go, I need to know what the name of the God is that I represent. And God said, I am who I am, Yahweh. That's God's name. Notice how Moses sees God as his strength and his salvation. That surely has taken on new significance on the other side of the Red Sea. Notice that he calls God my God, surely contrasting him with every other so-called God. And there were plenty of them in Egypt. Notice he calls God my father's God. Moses identifies with and stands in line with the promises given to the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God is their God. It is Moses' God. It is his father's God. And this God, he says, is a man of war. Why does he say that? And what does that mean? A man of war? Well, we call this sort of thing an anthropomorphism. It's in the form of man. Of course, God isn't a human being, but God is spoken of in human ways so that we can better understand him. He, he communicates to us in condescending kind of ways. Not bad condescension, good condescension. Otherwise, we, we'd never get it. John Calvin says that God communicates to us in his baby talk. He stoops to reveal to us what he's like. He's like a father. He's like a king. He's like a warrior, like a man of war. You might like to think of God as father or as shepherd or maybe even as king. But here he is all those and he is a man of war. He is fierce. So biblical praise is descriptive. It's theological. It's wordy. That's why we sing things like, like this. Immortal, invisible, God only wise. In light, inaccessible, hid from our eyes. Most Blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, his great name we praise. Yeah, that is wordy, I know. That's not the way we usually write songs these days. Part of that is that it came from a different era. And another reason for it is that it's about God. And we probably shouldn't write songs to God like a man can write about his girlfriend. We need something a little more lofty than that. No, a whole lot more lofty than that. Immortal, invisible, God only wise. Or holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Biblical praise is theological, but it is more than that. It's also experiential. It's personal. You see all the personal pronouns in what Moses says? The Lord is my strength and my song. He's become my salvation. This is my God. This is deeply personal. This is passionate and emotional. This is experiential. And in fact, it is literally experiential in that Moses and the people have just experienced something. So, First, sing to the Lord. Secondly, sing about who he is. Third, sing about what he has done. The main purpose of this song and the majority content of it is to recount what had just happened. There's a lot there. Verses 4 to 14 as they celebrate and recount what God has just done. Let me point out some big ideas within this part of the song. Notice first, God did this. The parting of the Red Sea, God did it. I know that's blatantly obvious, 
But it's nevertheless an emphasis in the song. God did it. It was God's right hand, God's right hand. Now, of course, God doesn't have a right hand. But again, this is an anthropomorphism. The right hand was the symbol of might and victory. And God has just wrought the victory. Not the Israelites. What were they doing in chapter 4, 14? They were trembling in fear. They were complaining about having been brought out of Egypt. And so Moses even told them, God will do this for you. You just be quiet. Did you catch that? You have only to be silent. That's your role. Shut up and watch this. Would be one paraphrase. God did it. Not even Moses is credited. Yes, in chapter 14, he stretched out his hand over the sea as God commanded him to. But it was God who parted the Red Sea, not Moses, nor his staff. And so in chapter 15, the praise doesn't go to God mostly in a little bit to Moses. It goes all to God, rightly so. And notice that God did it so effortlessly. So effortlessly. Verse 8, at the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. Verse 10, you blew your wind and the sea covered them. God sneezed and won. That's it. That's how much it took him. Just, just do that with not all at once, not too hard because of the person in front of you. But, but air coming out of our nostrils, it doesn't come out very forcefully, does it? But God did that. And the waters piled up. And God wrought this victory despite the unparalleled human power of the Egyptian army. Notice verse 4 chariots, hosts, chosen officers. Back in chapter 14, before we started reading, we find out that. Now, the Pharaoh assembled 600 of his best chariots and all the other chariots. Pharaoh's whole army went out, all the officers. He didn't take a, a few rent-a-cops and some security guards on this mission. He, he brought out his elite forces, the SEALs, the, the strategic generals, and his best tanks. All of them. This was the greatest army of the most powerful nation of any to that point in recorded history. And they knew that they were unique in their power. They knew of their own success. In verse 9, the enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake. We have a total of six statements in their mouth of their presumption and their malicious resolve to ruin Israel as a nation. And they were sure that they would win and they were sure that it would be easy. But they sank like lead in the water. Consider that God did what he did to the Egyptians justly and rightly. Don't for a moment entertain the possibility that these are misunderstood Egyptians who just happened to find themselves at the wrong place at the wrong time and just happened to tick off a, a God with a bad temper. That's not at all what's going on here. God was, in fact, quite patient with the Egyptians. They had gone 430 years of enslaving Israel, not to mention the countless other nations and peoples that they overtook before and during those days. So consider their cruel enslavement of people 
Remember how unreasonable the slave masters and, and Pharaoh were. Remember their genocide of the Hebrew male children at the beginning of the book. Don't forget about Pharaoh's stubborn resistance to God through each of the ten plagues. Consider their adultery, sorry, idolatry. Consider their idolatry in the face of God proving himself to be real and unique and the only true God again and again. Don't think God was being mean in his treatment of the Egyptians here. He was just, even if he was fierce. And yet, on the other hand, maybe the other side of the coin, there's his steadfast love for his people. Remember that the Egyptians' destruction was Israel's salvation. Verse 13, Moses says, he sings, You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. This is the way it works when people are wrongly oppressed. Justice means there's judgment on one side for there to be freedom on the other. And God had set his love on a people. And he hadn't forgotten about them. Now he has stepped in. He's on the move, to quote that great book about Aslan. And he did it not just to show love to his people, but also to show himself majestic and awesome and supreme. Verse 11, who is like you, O Lord? Who is like you? There is no God like this. And he's intent on showing that. He's intent for the world to know that he's the Lord and there is none besides him. He's, in, he's intent to show that all the other so-called gods of this world are not like this God. They're pathetic and stupid and weak. And our God is awesome in glorious deeds. He is majestic in holiness. He is powerful and just, sovereign and good and fierce. Now, God's word communicates these characteristics and attributes about God in some different ways, one of which is through like thesis statements or, or propositions, theology, we would call it. And at times, his attributes and characteristics are shown to us in stories, stories of his power and his glory, like this one. And so it's right and it's necessary and it's good for God's people to recount what God has done, to rehearse it and sort of preach it up to themselves and to each other in song. That's why so many of the psalms are called historical psalms by psalms scholars. They recount what God has done at mighty times and key points of his plan. Even heaven's praise in the book of Revelation is doing the same thing, recounting particularly what Jesus has done. But it recounts. We praise God for what he's done because it's right. Because it's fitting. We should praise God for what he's done because we, we can't help but praise him about it as we think about it and see it again. And we sing of his might because we need reminding. We sing at times because we're stirred to sing. And like a Coke can that's been shaken, it's got to get out. It's got to be released. At times, we sing out of compulsion. And at times, we sing in order to stir up because we've forgotten. Sing about what he's done. Fourthly, sing about what he will do. Sing about what he will do. 
Now, it isn't clear to me exactly where the song shifts from the past focus to a future focus. Clearly, by verse 17, it's future-oriented. You will. But the future orientation probably starts earlier than that. Because sometimes in the Bible, the, the future thing, a future thing is spoken of in past tense because it is sure. It's a given. We say it's as good as done. And so if you look down at verse 14 and 15, the peoples have heard, they tremble. Pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia. It's past tense. But Philistia and Edom and Moab and Canaan are not nations or peoples that the Israelites have encountered yet. These are nations and peoples that are still in front of them on their journey into the land which God promised to give them. These are the people that they will encounter and go to war against in the days of Joshua and following. They, they haven't encountered them by Exodus 15, and it could be, and it's likely, that these nations haven't even heard of what happened at the Red Sea at the time of singing Exodus 15 for the first time. But they will hear. These nations will soon begin to wonder about the God of Israel. And they will eventually tremble before this God. And they will one day melt away. They will sink like a stone. It's as good as done. Put it in past tense even though it's still to come. And then some of this is worded in future tense because it is future it's still to come so verse 17 you will bring them in and plant them on your mountain the place O Lord which you have made for your abode the sanctuary O Lord which your hands have established the Lord will reign forever and ever this envisions Jerusalem and the temple. If you want to read a passage that sort of brings it to fruition somewhat, you'd go to 2 Samuel 5 and 6. There, David conquers that mountain, which he'll later call Jerusalem. There, he'll, he'll make it a capital for God's reign and God's worship. But notice that this is even in promise form, back in Exodus 15, it's a full package salvation. Not just a promise that we know was fulfilled. Not just the hope of the enemies one day being defeated, which eventually they were. Not just God rescuing the oppressed, which was true even at Exodus 15. But notice the plan for God to dwell with his people. He'll put his steadfast love upon them. He'll covenant with them. He'll redeem them, purchase them. He'll lead them and guide them. He'll bring them in, and there he will plant them, and he will dwell with them, and they will worship him there. And from that point on, God just keeps saving and revealing and dwelling with his people. And his people keep watching, wondering, and worshiping him. Not perfectly so. It isn't a straight line from the promises here to their fulfillment, no matter how far away they are. There are a lot of ups and downs, a lot of bumps on the road. I mean, you don't have to read far at all in Exodus 15 and on into 16 before before you see the realization of this high point, finding a minor key. This song finds a minor key when you simply read in the next few verses that the water at Mara was 
bitter. You see that? It's probably a heading in your Bible. If you look down at verse 22, bitter water. And God made it sweet, but they complained that the water was bitter. And you read on into chapter 16, and they complain that there is no food. How are they going to survive? These people who have just experienced the parting of the Red Sea and the destruction of the mighty Egyptian army are wondering how they can possibly survive in a wilderness where there is no food. We're talking about this God, the God of the Red Sea. Food's not a problem for him, and neither is water. And yet they doubt. And so as great as that Red Sea moment was, and it was, the parting of the waters, the walking through on dry ground, the enemy crushed by the returning water, God's people being saved and safe and starting to sing with tambourines in hand, more is needed than this. We don't get to the end of verse 21 and read the end. No, it keeps going. And the rest of the Bible rightly looks back to the Red Sea moment as special. God stepped in. He wrought a mighty, glorious victory that still reverberates into history and today. But it wasn't enough. So the Bible rightly looks back to the Red Sea moment as a definitive victory for God, but it keeps looking forward and forward and forward because more is needed. And that's why Mary prayed and sang in Luke 1 like this. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble state we'll get to mary's song in a couple of weeks but we have to point out again this week that she's leaning on hannah she's leaning on moses god just keeps saving and speaking and working and god's people just keep seeing it and singing about it and so the multitude in heaven, which John saw in Revelation 15, they are standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Now the song of Moses has been combined with another song, the song of the Lamb. Who's the Lamb? It's Jesus. And why, why does he have a song? Well, his song is supreme. In Revelation 5, heaven's angels were singing, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. They said, By your blood you have redeemed a people for God. So where does redemption go from the song of Moses in Exodus 15? It goes through Mary and into Christ and from there on into eternity and as a blessing to anyone now from any nation who will simply come to him on account of his cross and resurrection. And how ironic is that? especially compared with the Red Sea moment. There, there are ways in which we should connect the dots between the Red Sea and Jesus or, or our redemption, but there are ways in which we should contrast the two. 
In Exodus 14 and 15, God is flexing his muscles and, as it were, putting fireworks up in the sky to show his glory and his power. And yet, our salvation in Christ, the mighty arm of the Lord was revealed not with what the world perceives to be power, but weakness. When Jesus gave himself over to his enemies, that he might die for sins, be raised on the third day, and through his death and resurrection, be victorious. How is the steadfast love celebrated in Exodus 15 finally realized? Through Christ, through his death, through his resurrection. How do all nations come to worship him? Through Christ, through his death and resurrection. And, and how will he reign forever and ever? Through his death and resurrection, he now indeed reigns forever and ever. But you wouldn't have seen it coming that day when he was crucified on Golgotha. But if you get it, if you look at the cross and you see your salvation, well, then you sing. God's people sing. God's people have always sung. God's people in a new heaven, a new earth will sing. God's people today must sing. They must sing about who God is theologically, emotionally, personally, passionately. They must sing about what God has done, what he has done in creation, in the Exodus, in the temple, but mostly, supremely, in Christ. God's people must sing about what he's done. And they must sing about what they've been saved from. Our trouble is far greater than a very scary and very deadly Egyptian army. And Jesus came not to defeat that kind of enemy, but he came to defeat Satan and sin and death and the curse he came to bear the wrath of God so that we might not bear it. Recount in praise what he's done. Recount, Christian, for yourself in song over and over and over again what he will do. You might feel yourself on the precipice of a Red Sea with something like an Egyptian army breathing down your neck and you feel like you need God to simply part the waters and give you a miracle and set you free. Well, he may or may not do that physically and literally. But Christian, you know he will do you good. He will see you through. He will get you to heaven. He will sustain you even when you feel weak. He will do you good with all of his heart and soul and strength. How do we know? He does good. It's what he does. It's who he is. He just keeps doing it. It's what he's done in Christ. It's what he'll do when Christ comes again. If we can bank on nothing else, if we can set our hope on nothing else in this world except the return of Christ, well, then, according to 1 Peter, we can set our hope fully on the grace that will be revealed to us when Jesus comes again. That's worth singing about. We should sing routinely, regularly. We should sing corporately. We should sing compulsively, responsively. We should sing thoughtfully and theologically. We should sing passionately emotionally and personally. We should sing loudly and we should sing continually. Let's keep doing it. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you once again for your kindness to us in your word. 
revealing for us your mighty works of old and our very eternal salvation. Lord, in light of your works of old, in light of our salvation in Christ, may we continue to trust you for tomorrow, for our lives, for what we will eat and what we'll put on. May we commit our plans to you, and may we continue to sing your praises. Until that day, Lord Jesus, when you come again and we will join heaven's angels and all your people from all time. And we will sing, worthy is the lamb who was slain. We thank you, Lord. Help us to recount what you've done now in song for your namesake. Amen.